Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. It's lovely to have you with us as we join together to worship and praise his name, and a very happy Mother's Day to you as well. And ladies and girls of the congregation, just to remind you that there is a daffodil available in the foyer for each and every one of you, so please do take one. It's just a little thank you for being our spiritual mothers in the Lord, as we do every year, and we want to thank you for that and thank God for your encouragement and your blessing towards us, especially our young people. Well, over the next two Sundays, we're going to finish looking at the book of Titus under the theme of Christian character. Today, we're going to see the importance of living godly lives for Christ. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are being watched. And no matter our age, we are to set an example to those around us. Paul is going to address several people groups in these verses, reminding us all that as believers, we need each other to spur us on in the faith, to set examples for the next generation to come. And on this Mother's Day, we do remember with thanksgiving our own and our spiritual mothers and fathers who have nurtured us in the Lord, who taught us the ways of salvation so that we can know the truth of our call to worship from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We truly are a blessed people, aren't we? Uh, And we want to praise and worship our good Father as we join to sing the words of bless the Lord, O my soul, as we sing of the 10,000 reasons for our hearts to find. Let us stand to praise and worship our Heavenly Father.
Well, having blessed the Lord in song, let's now bless him in prayer. Let us pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul, worship his holy name. Heavenly Father, it is good to come before your presence today in the praise of your name. And we want to bless and worship your holy name. We adore you as our great King and God, our Lord who exercises perfect justice and righteousness. We praise you that you are rich in love and you are slow to anger. That your name is great and that your heart is kind. Father, we adore you for every physical benefit and indeed spiritual blessing that you pour out upon us as your children. Lord, if we were to tell of all your great deeds, there would be so many for us to speak of. As we've been singing, there would be 10,000 reasons and more for our heart to find. For you are our great provider and sustainer, the creator of heaven and earth. You have the first and the last word in all things and your splendor and glory is evident in everything. Eternal God, forgive us when we don't remember to praise and thank you for your greatness. Forgive us when we whinge and gurn and aren't content with our lot. Forgive us when we put ourselves first or when we run after worldly joys and passions. Forgive our gossiping and slandering words. Forgive us our unwholesome thoughts. Oh God, we yearn to be more like Christ. We confess that we are weak in need of your strength and forgiveness each day. We do say with King David, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Merciful Father, forgive us, we pray, in Jesus' name. We do thank you for our assurance of pardon in Psalm 103, verse 10, which reminds us that he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For you do forgive all our iniquities in and through the death of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. His death was enough to settle our debt because of sin. His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And for this, we are truly grateful. O oh, Holy Spirit, minister to us. Help us to die to sin and self and instead to be molded into the likeness of Christ. Help us to rejoice and to tell others of our God's amazing grace and love so that whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let us be singing when the evening comes for 10,000 years and then forevermore. Because we pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, our scripture reading is quite long this morning, so I'm going to read part of it this morning at this stage before I invite the boys and girls to come up to the front. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Titus, Titus chapter 1. And we're going to pick up from where we left off two weeks ago in verse 10. And we're going to, at this stage, read until verse 6 of chapter 2. Titus chapter 1 and beginning at verse 10. This is God's word to us. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. 
Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Amen. And we'll end our reading there at this stage. And we'll pick it up later in our service. Well, boys and girls, do you want to come down to the front? And we'll have a chat down at the front of the church. Well, good morning. You doing okay? Yeah, great. It's lovely to see you out at church this morning again. Now, tell me, what is special about today? Go ahead, Charlotte. It's Mother's Day. Absolutely right. And did you get your mother a card? Yes. And did you give them a present or something nice? Did you get them breakfast and bread? Yes, very good. Well done. It's really great to have Mother's Day to thank God for our mothers and also for all the ladies in our congregation who give up their time for each and every one of us to encourage us in the ways of the Lord. Now today as I was thinking about Mother's Day, as I was thinking about our passage in the Bible, it got me thinking about a little song that I used to sing to Eliza And I'm now singing to my nephew Ezra, and it's called Five Little Ducks. Does anybody know that song? Does anybody know Five Little Ducks? Yes? Do you know how to sing it? Well, today we are going to sing it, because as you can see, we have Mummy Duck, and we have Five Little Ducks. Okay? All right. These are special ones. These are if you go to Hastings Hotel. It's all Northern Ireland slang and all the rest of it. But there you go. Right. We're going to sing it together, okay? And hopefully we have the tune and we'll go for it, all right? So after three. One, two, three. Five little ducks went swimming. Over the hill and far away. Ducks said quack, 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 quack. And only four little ducks came back. (gasps) <gasps> Four little ducks, right? One goes away. So do you want to hold this duck? You hold that duck, okay. Right, let's go again with four little ducks. Four little ducks went swimming one day Over the hill and far away Other ducks said quack, 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 quack And only three little ducks came back Right, we'll go here Right, go again. Here we go. Three little ducks went swimming one day Over the hills and far away Mother duck said quack, 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 quack And only two little ducks came back Great. Right, we'll go this way. Right, great. With two little ducks. Here we go. Two little ducks went swimming one day over the hill and far away The duck said quack, 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 quack And only one little duck came back There we go, great Now this is a special one, okay Because it changes slightly, okay So you ready? Let's go One little duck went swimming one day Over the hills and far away Mother duck said quack, 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 quack And all her five little ducks came back Can I have my ducks back please? Thank you (laughs) Great, there we go Great, and all the ducks came swimming back Brilliant Now you probably think your minister's gone absolutely quaggers But, but There's a very important lesson for us to remember in this little song. Because I know the song says that all the ducks went swimming away and Mother Duck just called quack, quack, quack. But do you think if one of her ducks or even four of her ducks went missing, she would just ignore them? No. She would stop at absolutely nothing to go and find her little ducks to bring them swimming back. 
And you know, it reminds me of our Bible story today. It reminds me of the fact that our God is a great and loving God. You see, lots of us are a bit like these ducklings. We can go wandering off. We can do our own thing. We can even say bad things about our parents. But do you think our mums and dads love us still? Of course they love us still. But they want us more than anything to say sorry and to come back to them. And in fact, in the Bible, uh, Jesus tells us that God is loving and that he is caring. In fact, this is what he says. He says, like a hen who gathers her chicks under her wings. God is like that. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to come to him and know his protection, to know his love. He is never going to let us run away or to swim off and to do our own thing if we come to him and we ask Jesus to come into our lives. Because, as Paul is going to remind us, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Because how did God show us that he loved us so very much? What did he do for us? What did God do? Alexis, absolutely. He forgave us from our sins because he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that whenever we come to him and ask him into our lives, he will bring us into God's family and watch over us and protect us. But we have to do one thing, don't we? We have to come and follow him, as Jesus said. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, Let us thank God for our mothers and our spiritual mothers. But let us thank God for sending his son Jesus to save us from our sins, to bring us back when we trust in him. wonder, could we say this verse together after three? One, two, three. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Great. We're going to sing of God's amazing love now as we stand to sing. Jesus' love is very wonderful. So high, you can't get over it. So low, you can't get under it. So wide, you can't get around it. Oh, wonderful love. Let's stand and sing to his praise. Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful Oh wonderful love So high you can't get over it So low you can't get under it So wide you can't get behind it Oh wonderful love Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful oh wonderful love so bright you can see it so bright you can hear it so sweet you can taste it oh wonderful love Thank you for answering questions so well. You can go back to your seats now. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can go back to your seats. Yeah, great. And while they're going back to your seats, please do turn with me back to Titus again, and we'll pick up our reading where we left off. Thank you. So Titus chapter 2, and picking up again at verse 7. God's word continues. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an uh, an opponent may may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pelfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Amen. We thank God for his word. And let's just take a moment to pray that he'll bless it to us as we come to study. Gracious God, we do thank you for your amazing, wonderful love. That love that sent, that you went to the cross to die for us. We thank you for your word and for how it reminds us that we are to follow you. That we're to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow you in every way that you guide us. We thank you for your word and for how it directs our paths. And as we seek to think about what it has to teach us today about living godly lives for Christ. Lord, would you challenge us? Would you encourage us? Would you you even rebuke us where we need it? But Father, may it all be for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, do as I say, not as I do. I'm sure we've all heard this before. I remember we had a science teacher, and you daren't have got on the wrong side of him because he was one of the old school. He had no problem giving you a clip if you needed it, and I have no idea how he escaped the courts, but anyway. He always taught us lads to never do three things. Smoke, drink, or gamble, especially at school. Now, one summer, one of the lads was in Albavera on holiday, and he saw our teacher, who had a villa there, in a restaurant, doing all three of those things, drinking a pint, using a slot machine, fag in hand. Now, actually, my mate was a bit of one of those guys, it was just a bit bold and brash, and he went over to him and said, all right, sir, give us a fag, to which the teacher replied, what were my three rules? Aye, but you're not doing them now, he said. The teacher said, it's too late for me, but for you, do as I say, not as I do. Not exactly the glowing example, was it? In our sermon series, looking at Christian character and the eldership, we have all seen the importance of practicing what we preach, of seeking to live authentic Christian lives in every area of our lives by following our Savior's perfect example. This morning, we'll see from Titus that the importance of living godly examples for Christ. As believers, our example in society should be exemplary. People should notice a distinct difference in how we live and act and speak. And to help us in our endeavor of living godly examples for Christ, we're going to look at three examples set before us in the pages before us. Firstly, we see examples not to imitate. Two weeks ago, Paul outlined that elders and believers are to hold to sound doctrine and to rebuke false teaching. And to reinforce this, verse 10 says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. We all know that in today's society, no one wants to submit to authority. They want to be chief. Churches likewise sadly are full of insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. Like the circumcision party, these were converted Jews who believed that to be Christians, men also had to be circumcised. They promote their own legalistic ideologies. But do you remember how Jesus addressed such people like the Pharisees? Every time he pointed them back to Scripture. And he reminded them that he came to fulfill the law. He is the only way of salvation. And God's word always has the final say. Verse 11. They must be silent, says Paul, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. As church leaders and believers, we must stand up for the truth of God's word in this society. To prevent divisions and false, shameful teaching for gain amongst our families and our church family. Now, the early church met in people's homes. 
And I suppose I'm wary of starting home groups because I'm not opposed to them, but I've seen how the wrong leader can divide churches and home groups. We may have them, you never know. But humility is needed. Notice Paul's harsh warning in verses 12 to 14. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Phillips notes, to protect the church and extend its influence for Christ, Titus, his fellow elders and believers, must exercise their ministry of rebuke. Rebuking those who sin is a ministry of saving them from eternal damnation by bringing them back to Christ from hell. Indeed, Christ himself, you will know, did this. He dined and he spent time with sinners. He had compassion on them, but he always rebuked their sin to bring them back to God. In Revelation 3, 19, Jesus summarized his ministry saying, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. These Christians weren't living godly lives for Christ. They were lazies, they they were liars, they were evil, they were gluttons. They devoted themselves to false myths and commands from the Pharisees. Not an example for us to imitate, folks. Scripture is our supreme authority. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled, says Paul. What God's word says is pure, well, we're to do it, aren't we? And what is defiled, we shouldn't. Guzik notes, Paul has in mind those things which, which are permitted by Scripture but forbidden by legalists in a mistaken attempt to earn favor with God. Sadly, legalism and traditionalism is like a cancer that effect, eventually affects everyone. It quenches the Holy Spirit. Such examples we aren't to follow. Verse 16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. I wonder in Clagan Presbyterian Church, could this be said of you? You claim to be a believer, but you're really just a good Presbyterian, whatever that is, or a good churchgoer. You come to church on a Sunday, but that's it. Or maybe only some Sundays. You don't live it out in your home or your work life. You don't get involved in the organizations of the church or come to the midweeks, for example. Or perhaps you claim to be a believer, but man-made traditions and legalistic ideologies have hampered your Christian faith and service. Jesus declared in Luke 12, 1, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. Leaven is that unseen thing, but when it works its way through the bread, well, you see its effect, don't you? The same is true with legalism and hypocrisy. It works our way through us to the fore. Let us not imitate the Pharisees, but rather let us live godly lives for Christ, trusting in and following God's word alone. For secondly, we see examples to cultivate. Chapter 2, 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Paul explained earlier that elders are to teach and to live by the sound doctrine of God's word. Bunyan once said, either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Don't live by man-made legalistic traditions, but by Scripture's sound doctrine. Notice, however, living a godly life for Christ, it requires continuous cultivation. A farmer doesn't just throw seed out and hope it miraculously grows. No, they have to cultivate the land, plant water, fertilize to bring forth growth. And the same is true with our faith. We need to cultivate godly characters. 
And the best way is with other believers. I keep saying this. But Christian fellowship, you see it throughout scripture, is crucial as we spur one another on in the faith. Indeed, notice that the different people groups that Paul says are to help each other cultivate a godly life in this passage. Firstly, verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and in steadfastness. These characteristics are very like the elders' qualifications, aren't they? And rightly so. Older, mature men in the faith are to lead by example, displaying these characteristics in all they say and they do. Chester states, don't become old, grumpy and cynical. Be like Caleb who willingly sought to serve the Lord at 85. Younger men should look up to you and say, I want to be like them. Because they are imitating Christ. Next, verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. We all can think of an elderly woman or woman who come alongside us as a, as a young person. and They nurtured us in the faith, can't we? Hannah talks about my wee dears, those ladies who have supported me over my faith and my ministry, particularly my late granny. But notice the warning here. To not be slanderers or gossips or slaves to drink. Rather, they're to teach what is good. Ladies, you have a vital role in our congregation in the nurture and teaching of our children, young people and young women in the Lord. But are you doing it? Leading us to our next group, verse 4. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Hunt and spiritual mothering states this. These characteristics indicate spiritual death. They also imply vulnerability. The older woman must be willing to let the younger woman look into her life to learn from them. Ladies, you know that being a mother isn't easy. And we're truly grateful for our own and spiritual mothers in the faith who taught us the ways of the Lord and who prayed for us daily. But sadly, the devil is trying to break down Christian marriages and families because then he can break the family of God. Instead of running off to Oprah or loose women or whoever you want for advice, instead we are to look to our older women in the faith and to the word of God for direction. For only then can you be self-controlled, verse 5. Pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. This is how God has ordained marriage to be. And to go against it is to revile, is to blaspheme God and his word. Submission is important, but husbands, before you think and gloat, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, as Paul says in Ephesians. You need to be worthy of that submission. Being prepared to sacrifice yourself for your wealth, your wife. As Christ gave himself up for his wayward bride, you and me, upon the cross. That's why Paul challenges the next group, verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, we all have much to learn in the school of Christ, myself included. But no matter our age, self-control and being pure and holding to sound doctrine, these are the common characteristics of living godly lives for Christ. They all require persistent cultivation. Why? Well, because thirdly, we see an example to emulate. Verses 7 to 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may not or may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Now, Paul is primarily addressing Titus as an elder, but these verses are also very applicable for us all as believers. As believers, we are to model good works, not because our works save us, but because we follow Christ's command of service. We're to display this integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Our lives must be in line with scripture, above reproach, against condemnation. 
wonder could we really say with Paul, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Our lives must testify that we are saved by Christ alone. Indeed, the next group that Paul addresses are slaves or basically anybody who works. Verses 9 to 10. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. You know, the Bible has much to say about our work life. As believers, we're to submit to those in authority over us. To work with all authority, well-pleasing, not arguing, not pilfering or stealing from our employer by wasting time, clogging in late, taking work resources. Because remember, we are being watched, folks. So show the good faith. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Live as examples in our godly society. But why do we do this? Well, firstly, because God requires us to. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. We are to seek to live godly lives for Christ because he has saved us from our sins by his amazing grace. Therefore, as those saved by grace, we are to train ourselves like an athlete. To renounce ungodliness, Paul continues, and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. We aren't saved to do as we please. We are saved to please God. But living a godly life for Christ isn't easy, as we all know. We are often rejected. We are rebuked as Christ was. But as verse 13 declares, we are waiting for a blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. When Christ appears in glory, he will rid this world of sin, Satan, and death forever. And all our pain and hardships will fade away as God pours out his grace upon us. Spurgeon said, the discipline of grace, according to the apostle, has three results, denying, living, looking. Denying ourselves, living for Christ, and looking for ways to serve until Christ returns. You see, ultimately, it is Christ's example we are to emulate. Jesus, who graciously gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, says Paul, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. How amazing! That God would send his only son to willingly sacrifice himself to redeem and purify us as his own possession. Do you ever just think of the cross? Do you ever say, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? What a saviour. Christ died for us. And how can we do anything else but declare these things, verse 15? And exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. We should be telling other people about this amazing, wonderful good news. Guzik states as God's messengers, we are sent by our king holding the word that brings life and turns back hell. What a task. But remember, as we live godly lives for Christ, we aren't alone. We're empowered by the Spirit to exhort and rebuke those who disregard us with Scripture as Christ did, imploring sinners to repent and believe. This is our calling. May we live it out for Christ. To finish, the Chinese government many years ago commissioned an author to write a biography of the great missionary Hudson Taylor with the purpose of distorting the facts to present him in a bad light. And as the author did his research, he was increasingly impressed by Taylor's saintly character and godly life. And he found it extremely difficult to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. Eventually, at risking his own life, he laid down his pen, renounced his atheism, and received Jesus as his personal saviour. You see, our example as believers, it leaves an impression on others. 
As we've seen, we are to be examples to others in the Christian faith, whether they be younger or older or a similar age. We're to follow Christ's example of humble obedience, self-sacrificial service. We're to point them to Christ and his amazing love that took him to Calvary to save us from our sins. I've asked you before, but if someone was to write your biography, what would they say? Could they see Christ in all that you said and did and so be drawn towards faith in Christ for themselves? They should be. May we all live godly lives for Christ as we heed Paul's words in Ephesians 5, 1-2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let us do as Christ said and did. Amen. In response to God's word, we're going to sing of Christ's amazing grace shown to us by his death upon the cross. The chorus says, my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Let us stand to sing and as we do so, the offering will be received. by once more in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you for your amazing grace that saved wretches like us. We thank you that Christ took our shame and sin and died upon Calvary's tree for our sinfulness. We praise you that our chains are gone 
that we have been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me because of your unending love, your amazing grace. Help us, Holy Spirit, to daily rejoice in our salvation. Forgive us the times we forget what you've done and continue to do for us. Forgive us those times when we don't live godly lives for Christ as we are. Lord, as we've heard from your word today, we ask you to challenge us and equip us to live lives that are Christ-like. Examples and role models to those under our care. May we not allow this world to dictate how we live or what we do. But in all things, may we honor Christ's name above all else. God of nations, we come to you today on this, the start of Ramadan and we pray that the hearts and minds of the many people from the Muslim world, that they would be turned towards you during this month. That as they fast and go through the rituals and meditations, that they would see Jesus and come to know him, not as a prophet, but as Lord and Savior of their lives. Lord, we know that you've done this before. We hear of many seeing dreams and visions and hearing you responding and responding to you in faith. Moved by your spirit, we ask. Draw them from darkness to light. And we pray too for the churches in these lands. And we know that sadly they are branded infidels, that their lives are often at stake. But we bless you for their faith. Their determination to trust in you and to reach out to their neighbours, whoever they may be, with the good news of Christ and his offer of salvation. We continue to commit our persecuted brothers and sisters to you, especially in these lands of extreme persecution. We pray for those who are in prison, beaten, mocked, whose homes and lands are taken from them, who are hunted down even on death row. Father, we cry out for you to intervene. That you would watch over them and provide for their every need. We pray for the leaders of these lands. That, Father, they would see sense. And that, Father, they would even come to know you as Lord and Savior. And so end these tyrannical regimes. King of kings, we pray for our own governments in Storm and Westminster. Lord, as budgets and price rises and interest increase and all kinds of things have been talked about, we pray, Lord, for great wisdom. We pray for tangible resources to be made available to all sectors in need. We pray for the average person working hard to pay the bills and we ask that something will be done to help us all who are feeling the cost of living crisis. Help us to be wise and discerning but always mindful that all we have is on loan from you. O head of the church, we pray for this election of elders. We thank you for those names that have been proposed. And now, Lord, we pray for divine wisdom and great discernment as both Kirk sessions meet to validate, count the votes, consider the names, and approach candidates over this week. Lord, undertake in every way. Give us wise decisions. Help us to be united as we seek to advance your kingdom here and further afield. Father God, on this Mother's Day, we do want to thank you for our mothers and grandmothers, those who are with us and those who are sadly not, those who wanted to be mothers but couldn't, and those who are but sadly are no more. We thank you for their care and love and support, for how they've cared for us, they've fed us, they've enabled us to be where we are today, how they taught us your word, how they sent us to church and Sunday school and sought to steer us on the right path. Yes, Lord, we know that each of us will have had different relationships with our mothers, but we thank you for your great love that is beyond any worldly mothers, that love that sent your only son to die and redeem us from our sins. You, like a mother hen, protects us under your wings. Lord, we thank you for our spiritual mothers here in Clagan, those faithful women who looked after us and taught us your word, whether in creche or Sunday school or Bible class, TP, holiday Bible club, PW, and mothers and toddlers, campaigners, who simply showed us how to live for Christ. As Paul has taught us, may those who are older in the faith draw alongside those who are younger as we seek to live for you in sound doctrine and in truth of your word. 
Finally, God, we pray for all who are mourning at this time. Those who find Mother's Day difficult. Those who are waiting for tests and receiving treatments, awaiting operations. For those who need guidance and direction. All who simply need your encouragement today. Lord, would you meet us at the point of our need. And help us to look to our good Father. who loves us. And who protects us in his arms. For we ask it for Christ's name's sake. Amen. We close by singing that wonderful old hymn that I quoted from earlier. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, should die for me? Let us stand to sing to his praise. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with you and your loved ones this day until Christ calls or comes and then forevermore. Amen.